Hello, my name is Kara from the Quag Wildlife Refuge, and I work here as an environmental educator and program coordinator. Today we're going to meet some of the animals that we have at the Quag Wildlife Refuge. But first I thought we'd talk a little bit about what we do here. So we are a nonprofit nature preserve located in Quag on the South Fork of Long Island, kind of in between West Hampton and South Hampton. The refuge was established in 1934 as a wildlife refuge, basically for the main purpose of the animals that are on the screen for ducks, geese, and waterfowl. So all of the birds that might use this beautiful freshwater pond that we have at the refuge. Before that, this pond was actually an ice harvesting pond. So in the early 1900s, it was used as an ice harvesting pond where they would cut up the ice, bring it into an ice house, and then sell it to people to keep their food and drinks cold. So there's some really great history that you can learn about the refuge if you'd like to come and visit. And our mission is to serve as responsible land stewards of the refuge property, its natural resources, and promote, implement, and support environmental education. So we do lots of programs in schools, libraries, for scout groups. We also teach here at the refuge and do guided hikes and try to spread the word about how amazing Long Island's native wildlife is. So the refuge is right on the South Fork of Long Island, again, kind of in between West Hampton and South Hampton in the town called Quag. We do have a nature center building. It's beautiful and it overlooks Old Ice Pond, which was the pond that was in um, a few of the pictures that I mentioned already. Our nature center has exhibits that are you can learn from, lots of different animals that we take care of inside of our nature center building. And we have posted hours on our website so you can learn more about when the Nature Center might be open there. And we also have lots to see outside. There are seven miles of hiking trails. We have um, trails that are labeled by color. So the longest trail is a three mile loop. It's the red trail. And then it goes down from there. The yellow trail is around a mile and a half. And the green trail goes all the way around Old Ice Pond. And that's almost a mile. So there's lots to see when you visit. And every season, it's beautiful. You can come and visit at any time of year. And uh, you can hike through the Pine Barrens, which is a really special ecosystem on Long Island. And uh, there's, there's, again, lots of native wildlife. We have fish in the pond, turtles, a lot of good stuff for you to see on your visit. We don't allow any fishing, hunting, we don't allow bicycles, and we don't allow dogs just so that we can make sure that everything is kept preserved for native wildlife. But again, in any season, you can come and visit our trails and the preserve is open from sunrise to sunset every single day, and it's always free to visit. And then another large part of our mission is to take care of permanently injured wildlife. And that just means that there, there are animals that unfortunately were in the wild and were injured. So some of our animals unfortunately had broken wings after being hit by cars. Some of them were actually raised illegally and kept as pets. And then they became habituated or imprinted on people, unfortunately. So because of that, all of these animals can't find their own food and that's why we take care of them. So without us, these animals wouldn't be able to survive in the wild. And you can come and visit our outdoor wildlife complex. It's right when you walk into the refuge, you can see our red fox, we have owls, hawks, a groundhog. So a lot of really cool animals. And the animals on the screen here were ones that we have had in the past or still have right now. We also have tortoises in a greenhouse that you can come and visit. They were always people's pets that were, um, were exotic pets and now we take care of them. So today we're gonna meet lots of different animals that we care for at the refuge. We'll learn about their personal histories, what they like and also what they eat and what they would do in the wild. So I'm really excited to show you some of the animals that we take care of at the refuge. So one animal that we have here at the refuge is called a bearded dragon. So this is a type of lizard that's actually native to Australia. And this guy was born actually here at the refuge. We had a bearded dragon that laid eggs and we incubated the eggs and out hatched 
baby bearded dragons. They were around the size of your pinky finger. So this bearded dragon has grown a lot in the last couple years, probably around, he's around three years old. And he can get a little bit bigger as well. But bearded dragons are really smart lizards. They are native to the deserts of Australia, but in the United States and in other countries, they're oftentimes kept as pets. And unfortunately for our bearded dragon, someone had them as pets, um, his mom actually, that they couldn't take care of. And then we uh, took over their care. So we'll have these guys for the rest of their lives. But bearded dragons are amazing lizards. If you check out his face, you can even see why they're called bearded dragons. So on the underside of his face, he has this beautiful beard made out of scales. And they get the name bearded dragon also because they can change the color of their beard. So if he was feeling a little excited or if he saw another bearded dragon that he wanted to say hello to, he would bob his head up and down and uh, his beard would change to be completely dark black, which is pretty amazing. So he can't change the rest of his body color, just his beard to be dark black and it's almost like a mood ring. So it will tell you how they're feeling. If he's feeling again, excited or friendly, bearded dragons will be able to tell you by just by looking at their beard color. So this bearded dragon, he's feeling right now, if we look at his beard, kind of calm. And uh, he's very curious though. And I think he might see himself in the camera, but lizards are reptiles. So that means they have scales, they are cold blooded and they lay eggs. So bearded dragons being lizards have all these amazing scales on their body, even through their tail, right? Their whole body is covered in scales. And they have these really spiky scales here that look like they might hurt your finger if you touch them, but they actually wouldn't hurt your finger because they are just kind of for show. They're there to make a bearded dragon look tough, but uh, if an animal saw a bearded dragon that had all of these spikes on it, they wouldn't want to eat it because it's not as tasty. In fact, if you use your hand to pet them the opposite way if towards their head, it feels like sandpaper. So that's really good protection against predators. So all of these spikes, I like to say, right, if we had a piece of pizza or an apple with spikes on it, we would not want to eat that. And that's the same thought process of other animals. They don't want to eat something so tough and spiky. So that's pretty good for the bearded dragons in the wild. A predator of a bearded dragon could be an eagle, a hawk out in the deserts of Australia. So they have that defense, but they also have another defense and it's called a third eye. So I bet you guys noticed one eye on this side and another on this side, right? Just two. But bearded dragons actually have a third eye that is invisible. And it's actually just a special scale on the very top of their head, kind of in the middle right here. And it's a scale that has a retina in it. So it's really just a sensory scale, uh, but it's called a third eye. And that sensory scale will help a bearded dragon if they were sitting on the sand and a big predator flew by and a shadow passed over them, they would know that maybe they should go and hide by that third eye. So it's very handy to have an eye on the top of your head if you're a bearded dragon, that's another really great defense. And these guys are really friendly. Um, he's walking around a lot, but you can kind of see how they might move and run around. They also have these really big ears on the sides of their head. You can kind of see it there. And that will help them hear their food too, and also escape from predators. But a bearded dragon eats lots of really good things. They are omnivores. So they eat a little bit of everything. They'll eat vegetables, crickets, worms. They especially love to eat these worms called super worms. And that means that we'll have to give them food every day. So we give them either a salad every day or some nice crickets every single day. And their food has to be chopped up nice and small, but they do love to eat apples, zucchini, squash, lettuce. So they are omnivores. So this guy's name is Diego. And sometimes bearded dragons will even wave to other bearded dragons to say hello or to tell them that this is my territory. Um, but he's a little squirmy today. 
But um, again, they, uh, those ears on the side are really good for hearing, but you don't want to get them wet. So we give them baths and we like to take care of these guys really well. Um, and again, they can live up to 14 years. So they have a really long lifespan and they don't make the best pet for everyone. But they are really cool to learn about. So lizards live all across the world and we don't have any native lizards on Long Island that would live in the forest. We do have native snakes, but there is a lizard called the Italian wall lizard. So if you ever see a lizard on Long Island, it's probably the Italian wall lizard and it escaped from a pet store and they can survive if there's a warm spot in someone's basement or maybe in the side of a business. Um, they can survive the winter and sometimes they'll come out in the summer and you'll see a lizard. So they're not supposed to be here. They were, they just accidentally got out of a pet store and then have bred across the island. But um, lizards are really amazing. And these guys, they like to dig. You can even see right over here, they have these beautiful claws. Um, as reptiles they also have to shed their skin so they will shed their skin in little tiny pieces whereas snakes will sometimes shed a full skin um, but they're definitely one of my favorite animals because they're so friendly so i do have a super worm for our bearded dragon to see if he'll eat um, on this video let's see so this is a super worm and it's actually the larval stage of a beetle um, and they're really good food for bearded dragons. They actually are a super good treat for him. So let's see if he'll take this. What do you think, bud? So he might be a little camera shy. <laughs> so he might not eat it. But um, again, these guys love their, their treats. They love the super worms. They also eat crickets and a veggie mix, so they are omnivores. And we're gonna meet some more animals. I have, we'll meet some mammals, some more reptiles and a bird today. So we have a lot to, to meet. So we have, we do have a lot of reptiles and we also take care of mammals at the refuge. So we have a fox, a red fox, a groundhog, and a possum that you can visit with outdoors in our outdoor wildlife complex. But an animal that we take care of inside our nature center are our chinchillas. So this is a chinchilla. His name is McNugget. And McNugget was also born here. So kind of like our bearded dragons. We thought we had um, chinchillas that were both boys. It turns out Paco was a girl and she had two baby chinchillas. So this is one of her babies, McNugget. And they are really adorable little mammals. Mammals are a bit different than reptiles, right? So humans are mammals, dogs, cats, whales, dolphins, animals with fur, right? They have lots of fur or hair, they're warm blooded. And when they have their babies, they give birth to their babies and nurse them um, with milk. So the mammals are a little bit different than reptiles, but these little chinchillas are actually from South America. So in the wild, they would live up in the mountains of Peru, in South America in the Andes mountains. And that's why they have all this beautiful fur. You can kind of see that it's really thick. They feel like a cloud. And um, they're actually one of the softest animals. I wish you guys could feel him. Um, but for every hair that we have on our body, a chinchilla has 50 hairs. So they're covered in this dense, really soft and very warm fur. Um, to keep it clean though, they can't take a bath, right? It's too cold up in the mountains to take a bath and clean in water. So they'll actually bathe in dust or volcanic ash where that there's a lot of that in the wild where they come from. So they'll roll around in dust and they'll shake it off of their fur or their really fine fur and actually get cleaner. So unlike humans, we would get a lot dirtier if we bathed in dust. A chinchilla, if they bathe in dust, they get cleaner. And it actually will remove all of the oils from their beautiful fur here. And chinchillas are nocturnal. So they have these really big ears, really big eyes, and these beautiful whiskers that will help them feel around at nighttime. And the ears are definitely great at hearing too. 
So these guys are herbivores. They eat just a lot of grasses or dried uh, grasses, maybe some fallen fruit, but they don't eat other animals. So they're not a predator. Uh, they are herbivores. So we feed them this really cool pellet mix, but they like treats. They love to eat peanuts as a treat or a dried banana or a raisin as a little treat. They are super fast though. And if they got out, they would run around and they would uh, bounce off the wall. So they're actually really, really fast and very good jumpers. But let's see if, if McNugget wants a little treat. So um, the reason why we have one of our chinchillas, actually his dad, Nugget, is because um, Nugget was someone's pet that they released and he found his way to a restaurant. So that's why he gets his name Nugget. Um, but McNugget again was born here. So we'll see if he wants to eat a little banana. Let's see, a little banana chip. And none of our animals wanted to eat too much today, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> So chinchillas are rodents, and that means that their teeth continually grow and grow and grow. And in to take care of these guys, we have to give them lots of things to chew on. So mice are rodents, rats also, squirrels and groundhogs. So all of those animals, their teeth continually grow and they have to chew on things to wear them down. So the same is true for our chinchillas. We give them sometimes um, little treats. They have things in their enclosure that they can chew on and wear their teeth down. So they have a nice big enclosure in our nature center building where we can take really good care of them. But to me, they do look like rodents. They look like mice, right? They have these big eyes and ears and, and a great, um, great nose there and whiskers, but McNugget, I think, is ready for his bath. So I'm going to put him in his dustbin and hold it up to the camera so that you guys can see McNugget take a bath. And it's right over here. Again, they bathe in this really fine dust. And if he's ready to take a bath, he'll kind of dig in the dust and roll around. And if he's not ready to take a bath, he might not do that. So what do you guys think? Is he ready to take a bath? I don't know. I think he's gonna skip his bath time today. But other animals will bathe in dust. Um, turkeys, chickens will bathe in dust, and it actually will get mites off of their feathers, which is pretty cool. So some other animals other than chinchillas will also bathe in dust. So another other animals that we take care of that are outside are some owls, and this is an eastern screech owl. They are birds of prey, so they have a curved beak and some really sharp talons. And all birds of prey have curved beaks and talons. Owls are the only nocturnal birds of prey. So in the same grouping though are eagles, hawks, falcons, vultures, and owls. Uh, this is a very small species of owl. Again, his, they're called the Eastern Screech Owl. And the reason why we have this owl was unfortunately he was injured by a car in the wild. He was found on the side of the road after most likely being hit by a car. And since they're so tiny, it can do a lot of damage. And when he was found, he was brought to a wildlife rescue center where he was rehabilitated. And for these owls and for other birds or wild animals, before they're released, they do have to go through a number of tests to make sure that they can find their own food. So unfortunately, Unfortunately, this guy didn't pass his tests, and that means that he wouldn't know how to find his own food again. So he might also have some, maybe some eye damage where he can't see as well, or some wing damage too. Um, but Eastern Screech Owls are really amazing animals. They come out at night, of course, and they are able to listen for their food. So these animals will eat anything from small mice that might be the size of my thumb. They'll eat insects like moths or smaller insects, um, maybe even flying ones, but they especially love to eat small rodents. So they're great to have around in our area because uh, rodents are often viewed as pests. 
But screech owls, even though they're so tiny, they still are great predators. So they can eat up to four or five mice in a night, um, depending on the size. So they're great to have around. And this guy, he is turning his head around and kind of uh, looking. They can he see during the daytime. A lot of people think they can only see at night, but they can still see during the daytime. So he's just looking around, checking uh, what's going on. And you can see he's as he's turning his head, he can't move his eyes up and down and side to side like we can if we keep our head still. He can only turn his neck. So what he's doing is turning his neck much farther than we can. They have 14 vertebrae in their neck. We only have seven. So that makes it more flexible. And he's able to turn 270 degrees out of 360. So that's almost all the way around to look over his sh other shoulder and back. But they can't spin their head all the way around. People can only do from side to side. So from shoulder to shoulder, we can look this way and that way, but we can't look as far as an owl can. And that's pretty handy when you're sitting really still at night and you're listening for your prey. They have to find their prey in the sky or on the ground. They have to be really silent. So owls have some amazing adaptations. And that's just a word that explains how they survive or the characteristics that allow them to survive in their habitats. So this little guy, he has really soft feathers. You may have noticed that they look a lot like tree bark. So that's perfect camouflage for a screech owl that's really tiny to camouflage into their environment so that they can both hide from bigger animals and predators or they can sneak up on their prey. So they look just like tree bark. I'll get him a little bit closer so you can see the pattern. And screech owls, they will be born in two different colored feathers. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a boy or a girl. It's just kind of like um, genetics, right? Our hair, sometimes girls have brown hair, blonde hair, boys have the same. That's the same for screech owls. So they can be born in this brown color face, which looks just like this guy, or they can have beautiful rusty red feathers. So we have two screech owls at the refuge. One is a red face and one is this brown face. Both of them were injured by cars, unfortunately, but they do get along and so they live in the same enclosure. Uh, so that's an amazing adaptation. These guys will blend right in to their habitats and be able to find their food. Another adaptation is those really big eyes that are stuck facing forward in their head. So these eyes are great for seeing at night because they are fairly large for their face. If we were owls, our eyes would be the size of softballs in our head proportionally. So they have these amazing eyes that allow them to get any available light. It might be moonlight, it could be a street light, and they can also hunt in darkness too just by listening. So owls hearing is a great adaptation as well. These feathers are called ear tufts. Those are actually not his ears. An owl's ears are underneath the side of feathers over here. So if you see that ring of beautiful dark feathers that almost look like a circle around his face right there, his ear is underneath there. And one is higher on his head than the other. So one ear is a, a little bit higher, one ear is a little bit lower. And that helps them pinpoint a sound when they're listening. So they're able to hear exactly where the noise is coming from. So for our screech owls and for other owls, if you guys at home take your thumb and your index finger and rub it together. And you can listen for that noise that your fingers make. So we can take a second, ready? If you rub your fingers together, that tiny little noise, an owl can hear across a basketball court. So they have amazing hearing. And uh, bigger owls have the same great hearing. So they have adapted to hunting at night or being a nocturnal predator. 
screech owls will live inside of trees because they're so tiny they don't want to nest out in the open so they will if you ever see a hole in a tree that's about the size of a closed fist kind of like this a screech owl will go into the inside of the tree and nest there. So they'll lay their eggs there. They would even sleep there during the daytime. So it's great protection. And of course, even if his head was sticking out, you wouldn't even notice because they have such great camouflage. It's pretty amazing. But at home, I want you guys to try to think, how heavy is our screech owl? Because they are such a small bird. They're about the size of my hand. So how heavy do you think our screech owl is? And I'm just going to stand back a little so that you can kind of get an idea of how small he is. It's a little bit confusing if he looks kind of big when he's closer to this, the video. So screech owls have, and uh, many flying birds have hollow bones, and that allows them to fly because it's, it's very lightweight. Oh, he's itching a little bit there. So they're lightweight. They have these hollow bones that are almost like a paper towel tube, right? So on the outside, they're hard. On the inside, they're hollow or nothing's on the inside. It makes it very lightweight. So a screech owl weighs only nine ounces, which is less than a pound. So if you held on to a clementine, um, that would be as heavy as our screech owl. And I think he might, did you see how he opened up his beak? I was thinking perhaps he was going to regurgitate a pellet. We'll see if he does maybe, but screech owls and other owls and even other birds of prey will end up eating the fur and the bones of their prey, right? So if he ate a mouse, he might eat the whole thing whole. He wouldn't be able to cut it up like we can with a fork or a knife. He has to use his beak and his talons, but sometimes they'll just eat the whole thing they can't digest all of the fur and the bones. So they end up regurgitating a hairball or an owl pellet. So it's just a, almost like a round or oval fur with lots of bones in it. They'll regurgitate it. And then they, um, scientists can actually learn from owl pellets by dissecting them. And maybe some of you have dissected them in school or in the past, right? Um, but these pellets are great because you can learn maybe how healthy an ecosystem is, what kind of prey items are in the ecosystem, and maybe how well an owl species is doing. Or maybe it will tell a scientist if we have to conserve more land for these animals, right, so that they'll have food. So he was opening up his beak, and I thought maybe he was going to regurgitate a pellet. We'll have to keep an eye out and see if he does. But screech owls, and sometimes they'll bait from the glove. That's just calling, that's called baiting from the glove um, when he jumped from the glove. And basically, we have a really good setup. It's called jesses that are around his ankles. And then a leash that attaches to the jesses. This keeps him safe when he comes out to meet people. When we bring him back to his outdoor enclosure, we'll take all of this off so he can fly ar around freely. So he can still fly short distances. And that's really important for him. And um, for these guys too, we have to make sure that they have enough food and water every day. So we feed them as close to nighttime as possible. And sometimes we'll even hear them make a lot of noise at night. And the reason why they get their name Screech Owl is because of the noise that they make. So I will try to make the noise for you all. It sounds a little bit like horses whinny. So it sounds like So I've never gotten our screech owl to call back to me. Usually he's pretty quiet on a program, but he is looking around a lot. So he's kind of getting interested in what's going on out here. And so we will bring this guy right back outside where he'll probably sleep the rest of the day and then wake up right at night. Lots of different animals live all across Long Island in our forests, in our backyards, and screech owls do live all across Long Island. Another animal that lives in our area is the eastern box turtle. 
So this is a type of turtle that lives all across Long Island in our forests, maybe even in your backyards or in your area. And they're amazing turtles. They are actually a little bit more like tortoises in that they have this highly domed shell. They have these great feet for walking and digging, but they are not swimmers. So they don't swim in the water. They do take baths and they do drink water, but they love to live in a forest that has lots of different things for them to eat, even berries. Sometimes they'll eat eggs or a dead animal, mushrooms, leaves. So they eat a lot of different things. They are omnivores and they are kind of similar to the bearded dragon in that they're reptiles. So turtles are reptiles. They lay eggs, they are cold blooded and they have scales. So his scales are much different than the bearded dragon though, than the lizard. His scales are on his body, but also on his shell. So his shell is like a modified scale. It's really good armor against predators. So a predator could be a raccoon, even a dog or a cat, um, lots of different things in the forest, fox. So that's a great protection for this box turtle. And the top shell is called a carapace. The bottom shell is called a plastron. And a box turtle is called that because they have a hinge on the bottom of their shell here that he can actually close up his whole body inside, just like a box. So uh, excellent protection from other animals. Box turtles are unfortunately declining in our area. So there's not as many of them as there used to be a hundred years ago, but we can definitely do some things to help, right? There we can, if you see a box turtle, always leave it in the wild because they are wild animals that are supposed to be here. We never want to take them out of the wild. And it's really important because box turtles will have babies in the wild. And if we took all of the box turtles out, they would never be able to have babies. Um, so it's important to leave them where you find them, to never move a turtle unless you're just helping it cross the road. And if you are helping it cross the road, make sure that it's safe and you can help move them in the direction that they're walking. So you never want to turn them around because they will, they know exactly what they want to do and they'll just turn themselves and go the way that they want to go. Box turtles will actually only live within a mile of where they're born. So wherever you find a box turtle, that is good habitat because that means they were born there. Their mom laid eggs and then they hatched there. And it would be really confusing for a box turtle to leave where they're born because they will know where to find water, where to lay their eggs and where to find food. Box turtles have this great camouflage though. I think their shell looks just like how when you're in the forest and, and um, sunlight comes through the treetops and it falls onto the leaves. I think their shell looks exactly like that. So it's great camouflage. And they have this usually some orange or brown skin on their body. And then you can even tell what kind of box turtle you have. If it has red eyes, it's usually a male box turtle. And if it has brown eyes, it's usually a female box turtle. So that's kind of cool to look for from far away. If you ever do see a box turtle, maybe when you're hiking or even in your neighborhoods. Um, their shells grow with them for their whole life. So their shell will continually grow. They'll have the same shell from when they're a baby to, to now, right? A full grown box turtle. And um, that means they cannot take their shell off. If you do find a box turtle that was injured and maybe it was injured by a car and its shell looks broken, you can bring it to a rescue center where they can actually help the turtle heal its shell. So it will actually heal just like our bones can heal when they break. So it's important to that we all help out these box turtles and but to always leave them in the wild. So the reason why we have this box turtle was unfortunately someone did take him from the wild and they kept him as a pet, which is not allowed. It is illegal, but they kept him as a pet for over 10 years. So uh, when he was kept as a pet, he kind of lost his wild instincts or 
know when to hibernate. So because it gets very cold here in the winter, box turtles have to dig themselves under some of the soil, go under a stump, or just find a good spot to spend the winter. They'll rest most of the winter and then come out in the spring and summer. Um, but unfortunately, this box turtle, because he was kept as a pet for so long, he wouldn't know when to hibernate. So he came from came to us from another rescue center that tried to get him to know when to hibernate, but unfortunately, he wouldn't know when. So that's why we take care of him and try to spread the word, um, try to tell uh, all of our friends that taking a box turtle out of the wild is not the right thing to do or to even take any wild animal. We don't ever want to do that. But these guys are amazing. So they can live over 80 years and they have this really cool beak. Do you see they don't have any teeth, but they do have this beak right at the front of their face that helps them eat food. And did you guys know that when a box turtle hatches out of its egg, it doesn't need any help from its parents? So a female box turtle will dig a hole with her back legs. She'll lay her eggs in the hole. And then when the babies hatch, they're around the size of a quarter. They're really tiny. They hatch and they know exactly what to do. So they have instincts that will tell them where to find food, or what exactly what to do. And they don't need any help from their parents. They don't need any help from people. So it's pretty amazing how intelligent wild animals are. So again, if you find a box turtle, just enjoy it from afar. It is really amazing to see them out in the forest. And I think every box turtle looks a little bit different than each other. So it's something really cool to look for. And next we're gonna meet another animal. It's actually an insect. So hopefully we have some friends that really like bugs. We do have some insects at the refuge and of course, wild ones that live all throughout the forest. And then we take care of some really cool bugs. This is an Indian walking stick and Indian walking sticks are from the country India. So really far away from here, but that we have walking sticks in our native habitats. They're much smaller, so they're not as big as this Indian walking stick. Um, walking sticks are really cool insects. To tell that he's an insect, you can count the legs with me. So he has one, two, three, four, five, six legs, and that means he's an insect or a bug. I bet you guys know what has eight legs spiders right spiders have eight legs but um this indian walking stick they are really cool bugs they actually just eat lettuce so they would live up in the treetops eating lettuce and different leaves um, and they will actually mimic they have what's called mimicry so it's it's a little bit more than camouflage so you you might have noticed that he looks just like a stick but he doesn't just look like a stick, he acts like a stick too. So that's called mimicry. And that means that even though he blends in with his habitat to protect himself from predators, which might be birds or other animals that would eat this bug, they'll act like a stick. So if it was really windy, they would sway with the wind. Um, they'll even, if there was a predator around that they get really afraid of, they'll put all their legs together in a straight line and fall to the ground like a stick would for protection. So that's why these guys are great looking like sticks, but also acting like sticks. And they don't bite, they don't jump or fly. They're really gentle and they'll just walk around. Um, you can barely actually feel them when you're holding them because they're so lightweight. But check out how his feet move, right? It's pretty cool. And then he'll use those top legs, which are not antenna. Those are the legs that he's using right now to feel around and find a safe spot to walk. So you can see he's using those front two legs almost like an antenna to feel where to go. It's pretty cool. On the bottom of their legs, they have these little tiny hooks that, um, that help them hold on. So they can hold on really well to my hand, but of course in the wild, they would be holding on to trees. 
these guys couldn't survive in our area because it gets too cold in the winter time. But very cool to see. And if anyone loves bugs, try to find some in your backyards and try to identify them. It's really cool to do. And bugs are super important. They feed other animals, but also um, they're great to have around because everything in nature is connected, right? So some animals only eat one thing. Um, they, there might be animals that will only eat a stick bug. If we didn't have any stick bugs, we wouldn't have that animal left. So it is really important to protect everything in nature because it's all connected. Um, and I think if we have appreciation for even the smallest things, it'll make the world a better place, right? But I just wanted to thank you all for being such a great audience. If you have any questions, you can always email us at the refuge or visit our website at www.quagwildliferefuge.org. And you can learn more about some of our upcoming events. You can learn more about what we do at the refuge and you can even come and visit us. So again, the refuge is open from sunrise to sunset every single day. It's always free to visit. And we run off of donations if you enjoy your visit. And there's some cool programs that we have like becoming a member and you can bring your family, your parents or your brothers and sisters with you when you come and visit the refuge. But thank you all so much and have a great day.